Welcome to the lecture number one of the Introduction to Neurobiology course. And the topic of this lecture is Resting Membrane Potential. This is perhaps uh, the only lecture in which we will touch a little bit upon physics and chemistry because we are starting to build this beautiful building of knowledge from the ground up and we are starting with the building blocks not even neurons but kind of what neurons are made of so there will be a little bit of that but uh, don't worry no pre prerequisites so you're not supposed to come in knowing chemistry and in this lecture I will ask several questions and every time I ask a question I will do that I will do this and the reason for that is that I want to give a clear indication of when I'm done speaking and you can start thinking and because I want you to pause the video and think about my question so the reason is to for that the reason for that is that I want you to make bets sort of about what will happen next and take a have some stakes in the game and not just coast listening to the droning sound of my voice gradually drifting into trance like state I want you to actually think about what we're talking about and you know pretend that you are actually in a classroom and can answer when a question is posed all right okay let's go so we'll start with some basic with like two or three um, basic notions and the first is the notion of charge so you know you probably heard the word charge like electric charge what is electric charge what do you think Okay. I don't know what your answer was, but it was a trick question, unfortunately. Sorry, I, I started with a trick question. Charge is just charge. Charge, having charge is a fundamental property of some elementary particles, like electrons and protons. You know, electrons are negative, protons are positive. So charge is like mass. It's just there. It just exists. It cannot be explained in any uh, through simpler uh, notions. So charge is kind of like mass. Some particles have it, but it brings us to the second question: like, how do Okay, I thought it's a different question. First, first let's 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 try to. That's you probably remember that vaguely from school. But how do charges interact? Because charges do interact. Two charged particles interact. Do you remember that? Okay. Charges that are the same to positive charges. They repel to negative charges also repel but a positive charge and a negative charge they would attract to each other so what I said before is that charges are this um, property of matter kind of like mass but unlike mass they are positive and negative so they come in two varieties and depending on the charges of two particles or like pieces of matter because you can have like charged dust particles or charged feathers or like charged humans you know when humans shock each other with electricity it has something to do with charge so there may be positive charges and negative charges that's the difference with mass but then the next question and that's the interesting one why mass is intuitive and charge is not because you know 
you probably have a very good intuition of what mass is, what objects are massive and which objects are massive, which objects are heavy, which objects are light. So mass is everywhere around us and even a toddler knows that some things are light and some things are heavy. But with charges, even though it's also a property that elementary particles have, and even though it also accumulates, like if you have lots of positive particles, positively charged particles together, you will have a positively charged clump of matter. And the same is true for negatively charged particles. So similar to mass, charge accumulates. The charge of a, of a like combination of several thingies is the sum of charges of individual thingies very sciencey yeah but so why is it not intuitive to a human I actually had students approach me in when I taught this class before and say like yeah I know basically I believe in what you're saying and I remember the rules but it's so not intuitive maybe something is wrong with me and then I have to talk to these people and say you know what it's not intuitive to anyone you can get used to that over years, but it's not like babies are not toddlers are not don't acquire the a good intuition of positive negative charges just playing in the backyard. Why? That's a fancy question, so please think about that. Why? And the answer is kind of interesting. It's because they attract and because they repel and charges can move. Because generally things can move, right? Like dust particles can move, air can move. Things that are diluted in the solution can move. So the reason why charge is not intuitive is that unlike mass, we don't have lots of charge gathering in one place. With mass, dust particles get together and we have like dirt and then we can shape this dirt into a brick and then we can make a building. So we can accumulate lots of mass and it just works, it doesn't try to run away, it doesn't try to disassemble, but with charges it doesn't work. If we get lots of charge, if lots of charge of the same, same kind of charge, either lots of positive charges or lots of negative charges, gather in the same place. They desperately want to change something. Positive charges hate each other. Negative charges hate each other. But at the same time, they really love like the other kind. So they want to get together. You know what happens when you have just a little bit more of, say, negative charge in your body? Well, I already mentioned that. Then you touch. It hap this happens in winter, right? You touch the doorknob and you get shocked because charges leave your body and run into the ground so you generate a little spark and even a tiniest tiny teeny tiny spark is painful but that's that's a different story so like charges go away and if a little bit more of charges accumulate in a cloud for example then you have a thunderstorm with lightnings which are giant uh, spark like things only much more powerful because charges don't want to stay accumulated unlike uh, mass unlike you know charged less particles so they always want to be balanced they always try to be balanced and if you trick them or like somehow spontaneously it happens that they stop being balanced something happens sooner or later and it becomes balanced again because of this attraction and repulsion does that make sense and i think that's important to realize because you know there is no magic about it uh, charges are not more complicated than mass it's just that we don't develop an intuition of it as as little kids so when people study about that it may feel like that's something weird but it's actually like world is weird but we meet different parts of this world at different times that's all and it takes some time to get used to these things uh, to some things you had like quite a few years by now to get used to them like light I don't know sunshine but some things are new that's okay we'll figure it out mm -hmm. yep next what is potential so that's an unfair question in the sense that you know if you didn't study that you don't know 
so then don't pause but if you have studied potential at school most people kind of study like it, it's at least mentioned try to remember try to think whether you still remember that what is potential you know not like human but not like she has a huge potential because she's an amazing scientist not that kind of potential that's like voltage the one that's uh, in a battery what is it try to think about that and then I'll tell you the answer <laughs> Okay, so potential is basically a measure of this hatred and love between different charges. What, what do I mean? If you have a charge that's positive and you have another charge that's positive, then it really doesn't want to go like I should. Like I should have prepared some props, but I actually didn't. <clears throat> Can I draw something? Okay, so if you have, that would be a positive charge, all right? And probably, like, whatever. This is a positive charge. This is another positive charge. Uh, they don't like to be together. They don't like to be together. They are repelled from each other. So if you try to bring the positive charge towards this positive charge, there is a force you have to fight, the force of repulsion. So we have to actually put some effort into bringing it here and so it doesn't want to be here it wants to go away and it's kind of similar to how with mass if you have a mass and you want to to roll it up the mountain you have to put effort but then once you release these things like you you you, you give up and you say like whatever do what you want they will immediately go in different directions so this thing is stable it's fixed in space and this one is free it will just run away kind of the same uh, the same way similarly to how if you put a ball on a mountain and then you release the ball then the ball would roll down the mountain right into the valley so this is potential in case of mass like the further you bring one mass from the center of the earth like so mass only attracts doesn't there is no repulsion with mass the further you leave it that it wants to get back with positive charges the closer you bring them the harder it is but they want to get apart but one way or another it's like there are places where they want to be and then there are places that where they no well in case of I'm doing the gestures the other way around there are places where they want to be and then there are places where they don't want to be and if they can go from a place where they don't want to be to a place where they like to be then they would they will and again that's why we don't have really strongly charged objects around us because charges try to move from a place with higher voltage to a place with low voltage if it's positive charges right so the only difference really here is that with um, Oh, I have a fancy picture. <coughs> so the only difference with mass is that there are positive charges and negative charges. And uh, so positive charges, this, this place with a positive charge would be like hell for another positive charge. It will try to escape, but it will be like heaven for a negative charge because they attract. So positive charges hate places with high voltage and love places with low voltage. Well, negative charges love places with high voltage and hate places with low voltage. So it's as if they were rolling on the surface of the earth, but upside down. It's like Stranger Things kind of upside down realm, where balls are rolling underground. <laughs> yeah. And you can, you can draw uh, things like that. So this is a picture from the internet. It looks fancy, but what actually is shown here is what will happen if you have a positive charge and a negative charge and you try to, to plot the landscape, the voltage landscape. Near the positive charge you'll have a mountain. Uh, this is a very tall mountain because the closer you get, the stronger the force becomes. So the closer you get to this other positive charge, the more suffering you have, the more the positive charge wants to escape. But while the negative charge is like the entire mountain because a positive charge really wants to go there and unite with a negative charge and uh, neutralize each other because they attract. Alright? 
voltage is like voltage for charge is like highness for water or you know uh, spheres spherical objects in a mountainous like mountainous landscape the summary basically what we just said same charges hate each other different charges like each other charge accumulates like mass but it can also move so most things become electrically neutral electrons are negative protons are positive and atomic nuclei are made of protons so yeah we haven't talked about that but it will be important in in a few minutes and lastly potential for charge is like height for weight positive charges hate high voltage but yeah but love low voltage while negative charges hate low voltage but love high voltage and another important thing that i have to say here is about words like hate and love metaphors are good metaphors are our friends and this is a tangent but this is an important tangent so from one point at one hand um, of course charges don't experience emotions so they don't actually love each other and they don't actually hate each other they just attract or repel there are some forces that happen when charges interact with each other but at the same time if you want to remember what's going on and if you want to quickly guess what will happen in one situation or another situation you can as well rely on these metaphors you can really imagine that positive charges hate each other that they like don't want to be charges that are the same don't want to be together same with negative charges but opposite charges like long uh, for each other and want to unite in this electroneutral uh, unity the benefit of doing that is that we humans really like drama and we really like um, we're really good in tracking who likes whom and who hates whom and all these you know small group dynamics and like she's not going with her because she previously cheated on her with like him and stuff like that people are really good at that so we want to utilize every bit of power that we have in our brain and we want to use it to develop intuitions for stuff so like high and low which is an intuition that we have because as toddlers we played with stuff and we've seen things fall right so high and low is a good intuition that's why people say high voltage low voltage it's not really high it's not really low it's just a really good metaphor that helps to remember what the heck is going on and same with hate and love and love it's not as wide widespread so physicists usually don't think like hate and love but i say it a lot and I use these types of metaphors a lot. Obviously, I mean, as any other metaphor, they're not true. If somebody challenges you and says, what do you mean by electrons hating each other? Do you think they have emotions? And you're like, no, stupid you, you don't know how, well, don't say that. You don't know how emotions, you don't know how metaphors work. It's just a metaphor. But we want to embrace the metaphors. And it's not a hack, actually it's how physicists think how scientists think they mathematicians they speak about like like for real if you if you want to google that you can google that later at your leisure google like smooth functions smooth google nice functions but then there are pathological functions so even in areas like math people use these metaphors from real world and from social drama a lot okay so that was the discussion about charge now we know what charges are next ions what are ions it's a tiny question but I guess make a bet what are ions <laughs> Ions are basically atoms that are charged. 
at least uh, as far as biology and chemistry goes. I mean, there are special ions in the interstellar space and interstellar space and in plasma in the like comets, stars. That's not what we are talking about. In our lives, it's usually atoms, molecules actually, molecules. I should say molecules because you can have charged molecules that are charged. For example, when you have salt and you dissolve salt in water, salt is sodium chloride, which sounds like a chemical, but actually it's just a bunch of chloride ions that are negatively charged and a bunch of sodium ions that are positively charged that are sitting together because they like each other, because like chlorides are negative and sodiums are positive. And so when you take table salt, it doesn't shock you electrically because everything is electroneutral. You have the same number of sodium and chloride atoms in there, so there is no charge overall, but when you put it in water, it dissolves and chlorides go one way and sodium goes another way. I mean, not literally in two directions, but they got all intermingled, but now they are in solution. All right? Why sodiums and chloride atoms are charged? Turns out that some chemistry happens almost like quantum mechanics, I guess, and I I don't understand that, I'm just saying the words. I studied that but forgot. However, so I'm supposed, yep, I can draw. However, so what happens is that every, every um, atom has a nucleus, like this is a nucleus, and electrons around it, and this is a schematic, electrons don't actually uh, fly in this uh, round uh, circles around the nucleus, it's just a schematic, but they are still kind of around the nucleus one way or another. And each atom kind of tries to be electroneutral, so for example in a chlor chloride, chlorine atom you have 17 protons in the nucleus, so 17 positive charges, and you have 17 electrons around it, so 17 negative charges, so that everything tries to be electroneutral. However, there are some good numbers of um, electrons in each of these, like, orbits. They're called orbitals, but they're like orbits, levels. And the good number here for the chloride, so the like zero is a good number, and also one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight is a good number. But sodium has this one lonely electron here, and chloride has this one, like one uh, electron less than it takes to make to make a nice stable orbital. And why it happens like that? Why like zero and eight are good numbers? Just let's let's we're not discussing that. It goes into um, chemistry and quantum physics and it's beyond the scope of this course. But so what happens is that sodium has this electron that nobody likes. So <laughs> this electron is like this stepchild from a um, German fairy tale who he has to eat with the swine and stuff like that, you know? So sodium atom, like all these electrons inside, they all fraternize, they're all happy, they get presents for Christmas, but this one is like, oh, nobody likes me. And at the first opportunity just leaves. And what remains after that, when it leaves, you have a positively charged, happy but positively charged sodium ion, which is uh, like sodium plus, because it has a charge of one plus, because it misses one electron. E electron. Chlorine is the opposite situation. It's like a family that always dreamt to have eight kids, but has seven. And so <laughs> this tiny electron that became an orphan, it is adopted into this chlorine family, and you get a chloride ion, but because you have more electrons that you can like afford, it's negatively charged. So it's like a family that always wanted to have a daughter, but it only has sons, and then they see a daughter, like a little girl who is sitting on the, you know, with matches um, in the winter, and they're like, no, we won't let her freeze, and they adopt her, and now they have a happy family, but negatively charged. Okay? Okay, good. So, yep, ions. And the interesting thing here, which is a little bit fancier, but still worth mentioning, that 
So these little pandas on the left are water molecules. So water molecules are not charged overall, but they have an oxygen atom. This picture is messed up, by the way, because oxygen is usually shown as red. And here it's blue, but whatever. So it has uh, water has an oxygen atom that's slightly negative, and it has two protein, two protons, two uh, um, electrons that are no. What am I saying? Two hydrogen, two hydrogens, two hydrogens that are slightly positive. So each water molecule has kind of one side that's let me pick one and just work with it like like this one like this one so this side is slightly negative and this side is slightly positive so it's called polar water molecules are polar why it matters because when ions of um, salt go into the solution these water molecules surround them if something is negative, then water molecules get uh, let their positive sides towards it and negative sides away from it. It's hard to draw with a mouse, so please forgive me for this like art. But if something is positive, then it goes the other way around. Like negative side of each water molecule goes towards the plus, and positive sides of each water molecule go away. So this is what's shown here with uh, sodium. This one, and with fluoride, this one. This will be kind of important, well, pretty important, but if you miss that, it's not the end of the world. But we will. this will be important in a week when we talk about action potentials. I will remind you about this picture. But that's not the, the crux uh, of the story, so... We won't go deeper into that. If you're interested in that, read more. Yes, and take other classes that go deeper into this story. All right? Good. Let's go further. Cell. And uh, here's a question. So this is a picture of a cell. This is obviously a diagram in the sense that, you know, it's uh, from a textbook. The cells, real cells are not shiny and are not cut like that, actually. They don't come in cutouts. They just, you know, live cells. But you can see cells in the microscope and you can draw them. So what are they made of? These thingies that we have here, all these lines on this image. On this picture, all these, you know, like this line, like this one, and like these ones, and like these ones. You know, lots of stuff is drawn here. What are they made of? What is the cell made of? Think about that. Do you know? Do you know that you know? Do you think that you know? Like what the cell is made of? What are these lines? <laughs> The answer is funny. So many people say proteins. And, you know, there are proteins in the cell, for sure. Proteins do all the job, but proteins are molecules. They're giant molecules, but still molecules. So on a picture like that, they would be pretty tiny. Maybe these tiny dotsies that are <laughs> shown in the cytoplasm are supposed to represent molecules. Uh, I mean, proteins, maybe. But they're kind of out of scale. These green thingies on the nucleus, because this central part is the nucleus, these green thingies are for sure mo uh, proteins. These are uh, um, nuclear pores, but they are also out of scale, I believe. Also, this thing is made of molecules, but, I mean, made of proteins. So there are proteins in this picture, but not that many of them. Most of these are not proteins. What else? So cytoplasm, I actually said this word. So this part, let me try to change the color. This part, the, like the fluid that's actually inside the cell is called cytoplasm. It's fluid, sure. So most of the cell is made of fluid, but what? But when you draw a cell, you kind of don't draw the insides, you draw these lines. So all these objects that are here, what are they made of? There is also DNA, 
So this whispery smoke inside the nucleus is DNA and like this part as well. But apart from that, what are these lines? Turns out that these lines are made of membranes. So most uh, objects in the cell, most of, of what the cell is made of kind of architecturally in terms of um, you know actual structures it's membranes if you try to draw a cell in a notepad like if you draw a two-dimensional picture each of these lines the line that surrounds the cell and the line that, the line that surrounds the nucleus and this fancy stuff that you can draw and the mitochondria if you draw a mitochondria all of these lines would represent membranes sort of cross sections of those and membranes are cool because water cannot go through them fluid cannot go through them that's why you can have in the outer membrane around the cell because it acts like a bag the cytoplasm and the fluid outside whatever it is either something in your body the intra intracellular fluid or if it's a lonely cell in the ocean it would be the ocean but they don't mix right because the membrane holds all right and this is the outer membrane will be important for our case we are not going deep into the cell we won't even mention it <laughs> anytime soon forever but the membrane around the cell is important for neuroscience as it turns out so here's the membrane as uh, zoom in <laughs> And it's made of, if you look at this diagram, it's made of interesting things. So we it has heads, each of them has a head and two kind of tails. And what are they? they? What are they? Turns out that they're called lipids. And here we have some chemical structure formula called lipids. And this is organic chemistry so if you're a first year student you will probably take organic chemistry in your second year if you're an artist you probably never took organic chemistry but that's okay we can figure it out so look in order to relate to this picture we actually need to know only the minimum of what what it, it is there about chemistry so these tails let's look let's look at this thing is uh, these pictures on the right we have long tails right this is a tail, these are two tails, here one tail, here two tails. And then there is something on the um, other end that looks like a head. So let's look at these two things separately. The tail is drawn like that, like just a zigzag line. And that's how in organic chemistry they represent carbon atoms with some hydrogens. So these are carbons and the hydrogens, but on the heads we see some oxygens, we see some oxygen with the hydrogen, we even have like a phosphate and uh, uh, nitrogen, so lots of stuff happening, lots of exciting stuff happening here, and here we just have a chain. What are these chains? A chain that's about that long is actually gasoline that you burn in your car. The chain that is that long is like corn oil. So the tails are oily, they're not watery, they're oily. Oil doesn't mix with water, you know that, right? If, if you've ever been to a um, um, supermarket, you've seen, this is an artist's rendition of a bottle. You've seen bottles of uh, salad dressing, and salad dressing is basically like water, salt, olive oil and some spices so you will see in a water in a supermarket that water and oil form these layers oil is uh, slightly lighter so you will have olive oil on top and then some water below and then some like spices in the back in the on the bottom but spices neurons don't have spices so let's concentrate on the oil part and the water part they don't mix if you take a bottle and you shake it you can turn it into like this suspension motion so it will become cloudy with tiny droplets of oil in water but if you put it back on the shelf and walk away and come to the same supermarket next day or you can do it in your cellar you don't have to be in a supermarket uh, you will see that they separate it again so water and oil don't like to mix and the reason they don't like to mix is actually because of that structure 
because of this fact that I just described that water molecules have molecules have a negative part and the positive part is while oil molecules don't it's just a tail of carbons that's not negative it's not charged anyway so if you throw a bunch of oil molecules together and a bunch of water molecules together water molecules would feel uncomfortable near oil molecules because they will have this side that's let me draw that again that side with oxygen that's negatively charged and the sides with um, hydrogens that are positively charged and like if you're near a oily molecule then this part will be like oh I'm negatively charged it's sad I'm attracted to positives but I only have like oil here while two water molecules nearby will be like yep everything is cool because like this negatively charged part is supposed to be a molecule is close to another molecule's positively charged part okay nice nice drawing good job me okay so if you draw if you drop a bunch of if you mix oil molecules and water molecules you will just get full separation they won't they won't uh, be together if you've ever seen soup in your life then on the surface of soup you will see these oil patches moving but here we don't have oil we have like oil part another oil part but also a head and this head this has oxygens and they're slightly negatively charged and we have this potassium thingy that's actually a lot of negatively charged and here we have a nitrogen but if you if you're watching it on your computer and not on your phone because phones are not helpful when you watch uh, presentations. It's better watch presentations on computers. So if you if you have a computer screen, you can actually notice that this nitrogen is positively charged. So these heads are all like friends of water. They're like ions. They're like salt. They like to be in water, while the tails are like anti-water. They're hydrophobic. They're like no, we want to be. We are oil. We don't mix with water. We mix with each other, though, because we're all oil. So what will happen if you, again, oil and water in the solution just form giant droplets of oil in uh, water, or the other way around? What will happen if we throw these molecules into the solution and shake it real well? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> What you should think is what's shown in the picture. The answer is here. They form this thing, right? Because, like, you have... Th How can I draw that? Th this will be a bunch of molecules. So, like, oily parts don't like water. So this configuration won't work. But this configuration will. They want to be together. While heads that like water want to face outside. So these molecules self-assemble into a layer. They self-assemble into a membrane. And that's cool. So that's important for what we will talk later. But it's also kind of cool on its own because suddenly you have these elements, these molecules that self-assemble into something that allows life to happen into a layer that separates inside from the outside. Because, you know, in order to be alive, you should at least have inside and outside. If you're truly one with the world, then you kind of don't exist. That's unnecessary philosophical. Anyways. Yep. Membrane lipids. These guys are called lipids. I should have added a word, but it's kind of sitting here, lipids. So membranes are made of lipids and ions, like a sodium ion, for example, it cannot pass through this membrane because it's charged, so it's like to be in the water. But this thing is like anti-water. So it cannot be here. If it tries to enter, it will immediately get out because being inside is very uncomfortable for it in the sense that lots of charges will be uncompensated and there will be lots of tension. And this tension will make it so that it will leave. It cannot cross pretty much. A membrane like that is impenetrable for ions. So that makes a good wall for the cell. Okay? Next. So, but now let's consider a membrane that's impenetrable but with little holes in it. 
and we will start with the simplest scenario. And the simplest scenario is um, we have so we have this membrane with holes. We have lots of stuff on one side, so lots of stuff here. It's like lots of lot lot lots of. And on the other end, we have little little lots of stuff on one end high concentration of some chemical little stuff on the other side of the membrane membrane though has little folds and let's start with a situation when we have non-charged molecules like i don't know a dye maybe the water on the left is blue and the water on the right is not it's transparent but there are holes and the blue dye can move from the left to the right what will happen Make your bet. I bet you know what will happen. It will equalize. Diffusion will happen, right? If you put a... Um, what's a real-life example? Like sugar or something. If you put uh, an object that is full of stuff like full of sugar in a solution in water then sugar will seep out because so they will leave why would they leave why does diffusion happen because you know things always go from if you if you tidy your room and then if you if you put everything real nice in your room you will put all books on one side, all pants on the other side, all socks on the third side, and then you put a bunch of like friends in this room and let them just have a party, then or a bunch of monkeys or ferrets. It the result will be the same. Everything will be everywhere because if things move randomly, then usually you go from order to disorder, right? So each of these molecules will move, each of these non-charged molecules will move, some of them will cross, cross the membrane through the pores, and the concentration will gradually equalize. And if you leave it like that for like 50 years, then eventually you'll have the same concentration on the left and on the right. Okay? Now, a slightly more interesting solution, I mean question. What if we have charged ions, like salt, like sodium chloride? However, pores can let both of them through. And again, the same starting condition. Lots of salt on one half, little salt on the other half. What will happen if you let it stand for 20 years? Same thing, right? No difference. Because even though they are charged, if both of them can move through the pores, it's like the same as if you had non-charged molecules. Some sodiums will leave, but some, some chlorides will leave as well. And actually that's what happens when people make pickles, because naturally pickles don't have salt in them, but people pickles in a jar and then add some brine and brine has lots of salt and salt seeps into pickles and pickles become pickled that's how pickling happens all right so this was easy and the next part was easy now the hard question like for real what will happen if everything is the same except pores are only wide enough to let one type of ion through so let's say sodium can cross but chloride cannot so let's say the pores are selective so again we start with the same thing lots of salt on one end on one side no salt on the other there are pores but only one type of an ion can cross only sodium which is positively charged while chloride that is negatively charged cannot cross you put it there and you wait what will happen
and this is a this is a hard question so what will happen imagine that at first everything is on one side and sodiums can cross so the first sodium approaches the hole there, are, there is no sodium outside right in the other half so it crosses through the hole it crosses through the hole maybe another sodium does the same thing maybe another sodium does the same thing so it starts in the same way as it happened before it goes through from order to disorder but now sodiums are charged so what starts to happen is that the left side now has slightly more sodiums so it becomes slightly positively charged while chlorides, poor little chlorides, they are left alone and so they stay on here and this part becomes negatively charged. And the charge increases as the sodium moves and at some point, so each sodium is positively charged. If the sodium uh, ion is positively charged, where does it want to be? Which potential does it like? It likes to be surrounded by, by what kind of uh, charges positive or negative negative so now it wants to stay here and here by once I mean it's attracted there are actual forces happening once it comes to the uh, membrane there is actually a force that calls it back like the force of all the uh, poor little chlorides that are negatively charged they're like hey sodium don't leave we love you and so from one point of view leaving so crossing from high concentration to low concentration is more probable just because you know if there is a door and a bunch of kids over here uh, then you know kids will leave more often than they will enter just because they will run to the door and leave but at the same time with every kid leaving leaving like these uh this door becomes tinier or becomes like there is a ramp there appears a ramp here so it becomes harder brambles grow so with every neck every other kid it becomes harder to leave and at some point you come to a balance to some sort of a stable equilibrium but that's a funny equilibrium because we now have a difference in potential difference in charge and difference in potential between the left and the right and charges work in the way that just a few charges leaving can change a potential relatively a lot because again that's why we don't have charges like lying around in normally because you know even slight this um, disequilibrium of charges creates big potential chain differences and all sorts of uh, sparks can happen so what will happen is if we have this fancy membrane that's only permeable for one type of an ion we'll have a difference in potential on the left and on the right and this is a picture from a textbook that shows the same thing we start and here they work not with sodium chloride but with potassium chloride for reasons and the reason is that potassium chloride is what actually is in the cell cells are not like pickles but the idea is the same if you only allow potassium to leave that are positively charged so all the logic is the same potassium starts to leave until you have a difference in potential and once you have difference in potential like the probability of leaving because you go of crossing because you go from high concentrations to low concentration is getting compensated by the disprobability like unlikeliness of leaving because it's getting um, potassiums that attempt to cross are going up they're positively charged so they don't they're going to that positive potential and they don't like that they want to roll back it's like climbing up the mountain so this climbing up the mountain becomes uh, compensated with the difference in, in concentration right so that's a tricky thing the more cross the higher the mountain so it's not a fixed mountain it's a mountain that can change so if it's if it's still if they can still cross they will and the mountain will become higher and then they can no can no longer cross if too many cross and the mountain is too high then some will cross back and the mountain will be again at the correct slope
correct like height. So the difference in the potential depends on concentrations on the left and on the right. But that's too fancy, we won't go into that actually. It's enough for us to get the gist of what's happening, and to get the gist of what's happening, you should just imagine that you're a potassium ion who is leaving its chloride ions behind and going to this strange adventure across a membrane into the world outside. Settlers. But the more settlers you, you have, the harder it is for, the, for every new settler to cross, which is not what happens with human settlers. So there are the metaphor breaks. But if you imagine them like hating each other, like settlers that hate each other, that's fun. Anyways, good. That's where membrane potential comes. So in actual cells, in our body and in our brain as well, every cell is because of that charge. Now, is it negatively charged or is it positively charged? Is the potential inside the cell negative or positive? That's a good question. So if you have a cell, can I draw? If you have a cell and it's full of potassium, positive chloride, negative, and only potential potassiums can leave because the membrane can only allow potassiums leave, but doesn't but prevents chlorides from leaving. What would be the potential in the cell eventually? Will it be slightly positive or will it be slightly negative? What do you think? Right. If positive thingies leave, the remaining things are negatively charged. So each cell in our body, each living cell in general, is slightly negatively charged compared to the environment outside. As usual, there are always exceptions. Every rule in biology comes with exceptions. Except there are exceptions to this rule as well. But, you know... <laughs> so, in general, cells are slightly negatively charged. And this is a real distribution of ions in a cell. So, outside you have lots of sodiums and lots of chlorides. Inside you have lots of potassiums, a little bit of chlorides, a little bit of sodiums, and most molecules in the cell are actually negatively charged. But the key thing is sodiums outside, potassiums inside. Now, if you're like a medical school type, you if you if you plan to do biochemistry, physiology later, you actually want to remember that because this is like a fundamental thingy. That's a statement, uh, truth. That's true for cells. Pretty much all cells. How to remember that? Where is sodium? Where is potassium? Basically, sodium is the ex main extracellular uh, cation. Is it cation? It's like positively charged ion. Sodium is the main extracellular positively charged ion. Potassium is the main intracellular positively charged ion. Chloride sits outside, mostly, relatively little of it inside. And then another guy whom we never mentioned before, calcium. So calcium is funny. Okay, let's briefly talk about calcium. Calcium inside is zero. The concentration of calcium inside is zero. And it's zero in, in the sense that if it's not zero, the cell quickly captures it and clears it out and tries to bring it back to zero. Why? Because every now and then it stops being zero. And when it increases a little bit inside the cell, the cell does something very important. So calcium is a signaling ion. And when calcium the concentration of calcium in the cell increases, something happens. And something depends on the type of a cell. If you're a muscle cell, it what do muscle cells do? They contract. So if it's a muscle cell, it contracts. If it's a, a cell that releases acid in the gut, in the stomach, not in the gut, in the stomach, it releases acid in the stomach. If it's a cell that uh, remembers something like a neuron, then increase in calcium actually make it remember stuff. So calcium is a signaling ion. All right. Again, how to remember that? Well, remember, we are all out of the ocean. Life appeared in the ocean. And ocean is salty. 
Ocean is salty and salt is sodium chloride. You probably remember that, right? Low sodium food means less salt than usual. Some people claim that it's helpful. Well, to some people with high blood pressure, it may be actually helpful. But so salt is sodium chloride, ocean is salty. And as we all took a little bit of ocean with us, as we leave, uh, left ocean long ago, the fluid outside of the cells, the fluid in which all our cells bath, it has lots of salt in it. So sodium outside is high. And because everything is electroneutral and then there are no sparks in the ocean, chloride, chloride um, outside is also high. All right. But the total concentration of ions inside inside the cell is about the same. Otherwise, this cell would have shriveled and, well, no, it would burst. But anyways, so there are um, ions inside the cell as well. But the ions are different. So the cell is different. Oh, yeah, blood is salty too. That's another way to remember it. If you ever tasted blood, you know that it's salty. But cells have a different ion inside, and that's the potassium. So potassium is high inside the cell, while sodium inside the cell is little. Chloride inside the cell is, well, sodium inside the cell is, uh, the concentration is small. And uh, uh, the concentration of potassium outside is also relatively small. Chloride inside is relatively small because most proteins, DNA, RNA, are negatively charged. Why it is so? Well, I don't know. It is just so. And with calcium, we have the situation that it's a signaling ion. So there is some calcium outside, not much, but inside it's zero. Because when calcium is allowed to enter, it always causes things. Calcium has this role, evolution rate acquired this role of a signal, of a signal that a cell can send to other parts of the cell. This is the summary. Again, a bit of sodium inside, a lot of sodium in the ocean outside, a lot of potassium inside, a bit of potassium outside, some chloride inside, a lot of chloride outside because it um, compensates for the sodium, and this special situation with calcium when we have almost no calcium inside. And these numbers are like average numbers because these numbers are actually different in different tissues, in different animals, like numbers for a lobster would be different from a numbers for a human. But this is like very generic numbers if you had to, um, if you had to remember the numbers. This is a decent guess. And this is in molar concentrations, which is, well, you know what, let's, Let's, let's not go there, because it's out of, out of scope. I just wanted to show some numbers to show that there is something a little bit more specific than just letters, but I, I'm not going to ask you that. Not in this class. Good. Let's go further. And just two finishing touches of the story. The bulk of the story is done, so two finishing touches. First, why would we care? How does it, why is it a thing in neuroscience? We want to know about the brain and all these membrane potentials, all these membranes, all this chemistry. Like, why would we care if we want to know about the brain? Do you know? What's special about neurons? So all cells have membrane potential. Neurons always have, also have membrane potential. What can neurons do that most other cells don't do? They can break this membrane potential. So when the cell is, so the cell is slightly negatively charged, slightly has a slightly negative potential, but neurons can do something special about it. They can allow, they have a mechanism that makes their potential change a lot. It first goes up a lot, and then it goes down a lot, and then it returns to where it used to be. How it happens? We'll talk about it next week, but as a foreshadowing, they have this special mechanism. First, they let sodium from the outside go inside. 
and sodium wants to go inside because the inside is negatively charged so sodium when the doors open for sodium they usually close but when they open sodium is like oh, there is no me there is no sodium inside and the inside is negatively charged and i'm positively charged oh my god i want to go in and so sodium goes in potential changes and then another type of doors open and now potassium can leave and potassiums are also positively charged and so they leave and uh, the membrane potential go goes back this is a preview this is not an explanation of what's going on we will return to that next week however just know that th uh, this entire lecture was about resting membrane potential about a stable state and this is important for neurons because they can they have this special mechanism that makes it change up change down and return to the basic level and it relies on letting on like uh, re lowering the standards of just how well the membrane separates inside from the outside and allowing some ions to cross and not simultaneously but first some and then others and the other question so if you know if it's so hard like where does it come from why what makes it so that potassium are inside and sodium are outside like we discussed how briefly probably hinted i hinted i guess did i at why it is useful evolutionary because the inside of the cell should be different from the outside because if it's like the same then there is no life so uh, life is based on the fact that you try to create order from chaos so um, the separation is actually helpful i didn't mention that but it is helpful and the membrane potential is helpful to cell not to cells not just to neurons but to other cells because you can use it in order to like move things across the membrane for example you can use this desire of certain ions to leave and certain ions to enter in order to transport things if you want to catch like you're a cell and there is a tasty glucose mole molecule outside and you want to bring it in how do you do that well grab the tasty molecule glucose molecule and allow some sodium to enter because they really want to enter and use this energy to bring glucose in that's kind of the gist of it we won't go deeper into that but where does the for every cell where does the potential come from like who creates it i mean we discussed where the potential comes from in a way if you have lots of um, potassium inside and then you open these leak channels and they can leave then yeah they will start leaving and then they will create the potential but but then but how like what separates potassiums from sodiums why do we have lots of potassium inside and lots of sodium outside why not in the sense of evolutionary there are different kinds of whys in biology not in the sense of like why it makes sense but what actually caused that who tidied it up what was the force that for this particular cell put potassiums inside and sodiums outside and the answer to this question is To answer to this question about why these gradients this difference in concentrations persists in the long term why all potassiums wouldn't just leave why all sodiums wouldn't just gradually seep in is we have other things in the membrane we have other things sitting in the membrane the membrane is full of stuff even this uh, picture is just a pale representation of just how crammed um, the membrane is with fancy machines and all machines in the cell are proteins almost all machines most machines the vast majority of machines are proteins so like this thing in the middle for example it looks like a channel this thing actually also looks like a channel but this one is closed and this one is open channels like those through which different ions can move like controlled holes that can lead that can allow things through or disallow it but there are other things all sorts of things in the membrane and one important thingy is a sodium potassium pump that spends energy and dutifully moves sodium outside and pumps potassium inside so it always cleans the stuff so that you had lots of potassiums inside and low sodium inside okay 
So then, yeah, and it uses energy. And good question, what will happen if we block it? So if you catch a bird and block this pump in a bird, what will happen? Make a bet. You're probably tired, so let's see. What do you think? What will happen if we block it? That's the last question of the season. What will happen if we block it? Well, the pump won't work anymore, so indeed the concentration of potassium inside will start to decrease. The concentration of sodium inside will start to increase, and at some point everything will break. And it's called a poison. And indeed this poison exists, and it's called ubain, I guess. I'm not sure how to read that. Ubain. But it's a poison that's used to kill birds and prey. In it was used for arrow poison in Africa. And the symptoms, fun. The symptoms include rapid twitching, irregular breathing, convulsions, and death of cardiac arrest. And if you think of it, these symptoms, what do they rem remind you of? Twitching, so it's like muscles, right? And maybe neurons that connect to muscles. Breathing, well, breathing, what controls breathing? Brain, of course, right? So something is wrong with breathing. Convulsions, so it all feels like something is wrong with the nervous system because probably the first thing, even though the, uh, if this thing is blocked in the body, all cells will gradually go towards like death and dysfunction, but the cells that will be affected first will be the cells in muscles and nerves and cardiac, cardiac arrest means that cardiac muscles will stop um, functioning because muscles also has action potentials in the same way well slightly different than neurons but also the action potential and I believe that this yeah this optimistic slide is the last slide in the presentation and now you know What do you know? Now you know where the resting membrane potential comes from and you have a quick uh, way to remember the relative concentration of ions outside and inside, at least in rough term, in terms of a lot or little. And uh, yeah, and on, on the way we also learned a whole bunch of useful things like ions and charges and channels and pumps. Good, see you later.